that have uh, moved uh, main forward on these activities. And, you know, from the renewable portfolio standard of, of LD1494, increasing Maine's RPS to 80% by 2030 and setting a goal um, by 2050 will be the focus today. But I think important to notice that uh, and know that in the background, we also have uh, um, significant amount, amounts of distributed generation being added to the grid. There's some of the policy changes that, that came forward through LD1711 and then also seeing, you know, very significant uh, uh, beneficial electrification happening through uh, uh, the heating heating sector at Efficiency Maine and, and other areas. So putting that into context, um, you know, just wanted to, wanted to raise that. I think if you're on this call, you're aware of those, but I want to make sure to cover that. Next slide. And it, it also think it's really important to delineate this this assessment from what's happening at the Maine Climate Council. Obviously, the, the as I'm sure you know, the Climate Council uh, began meeting over a year ago and is slated to. Um, put forward a climate action plan by December 1st of this year. So in less than a month, there will be a climate action plan that is that is published and that will um, have some um, obvious overlap with the work that this market assessment is going to be is going to be uh, working on. But they're they're separate different activities. I think there will be um, an opportunity to uh, learn from and build on a lot of the work that uh, came out of the Climate Council. There was an energy working group um, that has, uh, looked at some of the issues that we're going to be talking about here today, a buildings uh, working group and a transportation working group, which are going to impact this work. Um, I think that the opportunity that this study offers, and we'll get into it a little bit more as we go forward, is really a look at the next 10 years. The, the Climate Action Plan was a uh, looking all the way out to 2050. It did have a focus on, um, in many ways, kind of what could we do now to get us on the pathway to, to meet those uh, ambitious GHG reduction targets, um, but this will be primarily focused just on the RPS uh, over the next 10 years and what we need to do to meet that. Obviously, we'll be looking at longer term impacts and what we need to do um, beyond that, but um, as required by statute, this will really focus on that and be, uh, I think, um, a good uh, companion document to what's happening at the Climate Council. Next slide. So as, as I'm sure you know, uh, you know, renewable portfolio standards are, um, you know, a, a common policy mechanism to uh, drive renewable energy development across the state. There are uh, a number of different standards across the country. Maine has one of the most ambitious. Uh, this this comes from July 2019. I think there have been updates since then, but just you know, there are, each each of these are different, but they are a common, um, you know, common uh, policy mechanism that states use to. To increase the amount of uh, renewable energy generation happening at their uh, uh, happening in the state, and I, you know, this isn't the only policy that moves renewables forward, but I think it's really, uh, you know, an important piece of the work that we're doing here in Maine. And I, you know, you can see the uh, up, uh, at least in uh, New England and the northern part of the country, um, there's a lot of opportunity to make sure that we understand what's what's happening in the markets around us and how Maine's um, RPS um, works within those. Next slide. So LD 1494 uh, signed by the governor last year after uh, bipartisan support in the legislature increased Maine's RPS to 80% from 2030. That is up from 40%. Um, if you look at that chart on the bottom right, you can see that Maine went from having, um, as far as uh, class one or, or newer resources, having a, a flat um, uh, growth trajectory to having the purple line there is, is Maine having the most ambitious uh, uh, RPS in the region. Um, and I think one of the things that are important that came out of that is not just this increase in the in Maine's RPS, but as um, policy mechanisms and, and tools for the state to begin to add more renewable energy to the grid. Uh, the PUC just ran a, a required uh, procurement for long-term contracts for clean energy. You can see the results that are listed there, more than 500 megawatts secured uh, with uh, not just very competitive prices, but guaranteed economic benefits to be provided to the state. So an exciting, um, you know, Maine's largest clean energy procurement in, in our state's history, um, uh, about nine and a half percent was uh, uh, awarded, nine, nine and a half percent of Maine's electric load was awarded. It could have gone up to 10 percent. And so the remainder is uh, uh, required to be um, procured in the second tranche, which per statute has to go out before 
uh, by January 15th of next year. So there's another second tranche required in that. Next slide. So the, the uh, kind of the final piece of that legislation uh, is, is really why we're here today. Um, it, it set these ambitious uh, goals and, and, and mandates and targets had uh, components around um, required procurements for long-term contracts and then required a uh, this renewable energy market assessment. I won't go through exactly the, the component, uh, every piece of the legislation. I encourage folks to look at LD 1494 and see the, the uh, seven or eight bullets that are within that if they have questions uh, generally. But the, this study is really going to look at um, uh, available technology that the main could use to uh, or have an impact on our RPS, estimated costs, benefits, um, information around those technologies, going to look at time frames, you know, what, what uh, are there things that we need to do uh, around, around permitting or project development that are um, important for us to be thinking through, going to look at policy and regulatory options that we need to make uh, that we might need to consider to most uh, effectively meet our RPS um, targets, uh, requires a look specifically at waste to energy, landfill gas, and AD, and then uh, there was also going to be a focus on on equity and making sure that um, you know we're taking that into consideration, looking at these policies. And so we are. Uh, uh, this study is funded per, per legislation by the uh, funding from the Public Utilities Commission or, or ratepayers, and we are excited to have brought on um, two consultants to help. And they'll be taking over the, the remainder of the uh, portion of this presentation. We've got uh, Energy Environmental Economics or E3 and Applied Economics Clinic or AE, AEC. And so, you know, we're thrilled to be uh, to be putting this study forward. We think it's very timely given all the activity happening. Um, I think it's um, compatible and will work well with what's happening in the Climate Council. Um, I should note that this is required to be submitted uh, at the end of January of, of 2021. So we are on a kind of a short time frame, but given where we are in the um, policy development procurements just happening, you know, I think it's a really timely um, exercise for us to be going through. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, E3, and uh, thank you all again for, for being a part of this. Great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me, uh, and if not, raise your hands. <laughs> um, but uh, my name is Liz Matatal. I'm a, a managing consultant in E3's Boston office, and you know, our team is really excited to be supporting the uh, Maine Governor's Energy Office on this important work assessing uh, the renewable energy market. Uh, our E3 team includes Lakshmi Alagapkin and uh, project manager Samrat Kasina, um, and our modelers Charlie Duff and Bill Weedle. Um, <clears throat> and for this work, we're um, you know excited and happy to be collaborating with uh, Liz Stanton and Brindis Woods from the Applied Economics Clinic, um, and they're going to introduce themselves and their organization in a few slides. Um, so thanks all everyone for coming today. Uh, just in terms of the plan over the next uh, 80 minutes, so we're going to spend, uh, you know, till around 2.15, so, you know, uh, the first 45 minutes of this session providing you an overview of our study, uh, the modeling approach, and um, kind of some of the key equity considerations. Uh, we'll then spend the rest of the session uh, answering questions that you may have about uh, the study or the process, um, and then give you some uh, details on how you can provide written feedback um, online after this session. So uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we get into the content. So uh, if you have questions as we're going through this deck, uh, we'll be collecting them in a queue to respond to um, after we get through uh, this next set of slides, just given the size of the group and the you know, limited time we have together. So. Uh, you have two ways to provide questions. Uh, one is to uh, use that chat function, and we ask you to post your question to all panelists. Um, and the second way you can do that is uh, through the raise your hand function. Um, and if you do that, what we will do is uh, basically call on you in the second half of the session so that we can uh, answer your question. And this just notes how to, uh, how to, re how to reach all panelists. <laughs> So I'll start with just a, a brief introduction of who we are at E3. So we are an economic consultancy focused on the energy sector and electricity markets in particular. 
Um, as I noted, we have an office in Boston, as well as uh, a headquarters in San Francisco and offices in New York and Calgary. Uh, we serve a broad range of clients, so including governments, as well as utilities, developers, regulators, environmental groups. Um, and we really bring, you know, evidence-based economic analysis uh, to decisions around clean energy deployment. Um, so I guess, you know, we've worked broadly across North America on studies advising clients on how to achieve, you know, high levels of renewable penetration, including, you know, 100% clean energy. So the list here just gives you a sense of some of the places across the U.S. and the types of clients um, where we've done uh, similar work. Um, and I'll just note that, you know, we have recent and ongoing work here in, here in, New, in and around New England. So uh, some of you may be aware we supported Calpine on a study recently of reliability under deep decarbonization. Uh, in New York, we're supporting NYSERDA on the state's plan to achieve net zero. Uh, just so over the border in Canada, we've been supporting you know, Nova Scotia on resource planning under deep decarbonization. So you know, we've really been uh, involved in some of the issues that, that Maine is facing uh, through this work throughout the Northeast. I'm going to pass the mic to uh, Brindis, and I'll let her introduce AEC. Thank you, Liz. I hope everyone can hear me. Please raise your hand if you can't. Um, as she mentioned, I am Brindis Woods. I am a researcher at the Applied Economics Clinic, and we are a nonprofit consulting group. Um, we're housed in Arlington, Massachusetts, and we were founded by um, my colleague Liz Stanton in 2017. She's not on this call today, but she is involved in the project uh, alongside me. And we work, um, our experts at AEC work on behalf of our clients, providing assessments related to the environment, consumer rights, the energy sector, and community equity. And we've been working a lot more uh, on these sort of clean and just energy transitions uh, lately, particularly here in the New England region. We provided um, the social equity analysis for Boston's Carbon Free Boston plan, for example. And on behalf of this new political coalition called Renew New England, we provided them with um, some data analysis that provided visualizations of racial inequity across across the region. So I'm really excited to uh, work on this project with everyone. Thanks, Liz. Back to you. Great. Um, so as Dan mentioned earlier, the study's primary goal is to assess you know potential renewable portfolios that could be built within Maine over the next decade. Um, and it's sort of the um, explicitly to meet uh, Maine's LD 1494 RPS target, you know, of, of 80% by 2030, um, and kind of set them up to hit that 100% uh, renewable by 2050. Um, and the study will assess, you know, uh, how policy and regulatory mechanisms could influence the timing and cost to ratepayer through the scenario design. I mean, we'll look at outcomes, including, you know, the renewable portfolio and associated transmission needs and the, the cost and equity implications. Um, and as I'll speak to in a few slides, we're going to be utilizing, sorry, utilizing uh, E3's uh, renewable portfolio planning tool, which, you know, it's a transparent spreadsheet based model that's used to perform a scenario based analysis of future renewable portfolio development. So, um, as we noted, in, uh, Maine has set out both ambitious, you know, economy-wide targets as well as electricity sector targets. Um, so, this study is really looking at what we need to do in the next 10 years uh, to both achieve this near-term 2030 target as well as set us up to be on a path to hit that 2050 100% target. So, the graph we're showing here on the bottom uh, on the uh, y-axis axis has uh, the amount of RPS energy in gigawatt hours that would be required to meet the RPS target in a given year. Now, this is going to be a function of the load trajectory. So, as you look over time, uh, which is shown on the x-axis, you know, that we're showing basically a range of load trajectories. And what this reflects is varying assumptions about the level of electrification within Maine. And you know, we know that Maine will electrify to some extent in order to support, you know, economy-wide decarbonization, and that's going to have implications for the, uh, you know, the timing and the amount of renewables needed to hit that RPS. So the low trajectories that we're showing are based on the recent synapse work um, 
uh, with the Maine Climate Council on, you know, from this uh, sustained policy to the decar deep decarbonization uh, load fat forecasts, um, which uh, are based on, you know, assumptions around EV and heat pump adoption. Uh, you know, we've, we've footnoted here, but we wanted to acknowledge, you know, Synapse has uh, released updated load forecasts, and so um, we're still considering uh, whether or not, you know, we update to that load forecast, but we're definitely um, aware of and, and looking at how that would influence the RPS need. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the scenario approach and then get into some of the specific assumptions. So, you know, uh, at a high level, our approach to this study is not to model, you know, a single optimal projection, but to model a set of potential scenarios which vary um, in assumptions and constraints uh, to reflect, you know, potential policy or regulatory initiatives um, to provide a set of plausible outcomes in terms of, you know, builds, the timing of the builds, and the uh, all the associated implications for cost, infrastructure, and equity. So scenarios are designed, you know, broadly to, to inform the design uh, and direction of potential policy, uh, but we're not you know, predicting a single path. And, you know, we want to acknowledge at the onset, you know, this is a dynamic industry. There are lots of players and changing uh, technology, cost, um, uh, and, uh, you know, market conditions that are going to vary um, planning decisions that are made over time. And, you know, to that end, on the next slide, we want to just note some of those factors that we uh, recognize are going to affect development uh, patterns within the state. So, um, you know, I'm not going to go through every one of these, you know, dozen or so bullets, um, but I'm going to highlight a few of these. And then I want to call your attention to this blue box on the bottom, which is to say, um, you know, we want to ask you both, you know, is this the right list of factors? Um, and, you know, are we thinking about these factors the right way um, in as we design the scenarios? And um, we'll talk through at the end, but there is a form in which you can provide uh, written feedback after this session. So, you know, some of the, the factors that we recognize are going to affect renewable development um, are, you know, assumptions around uh, the availability and cost and uh, pace of uh, deployment of different renewable technologies. And, you know, they're on um, sort of different uh, different points in their curve of uh, commercialization and cost. Um, and so, you know, we recognize that and we're, you know, we're, we are working on assumptions uh, related to, you know, wind, solar, hydro, biomass, waste to energy, anaerobic digestion. And so, you know, we're considering all of those resources. Um, you know, we also wanted to just acknowledge, um, and we'll talk about it in a couple of slides, that, you know, uh, transmission assumptions are going to matter a lot. Um, uh, in terms of where and what the cost is of building renewables. Um, you know, load growth, as I mentioned on the previous slide, is, um, you know, driven by economy-wide decarbonization. And so we are, um, you know, incorporating that into the design of the scenarios. Uh, we also recognize, you know, for DERs, the um, uh, potential to provide, you know, customer control and avoid potentially some infrastructure. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll just note, I guess, on the land use side, you know, certainly recognizing uh, while there are significant quantities of land in Maine, uh, you know, there's also significant forest cover and all other land uses that, you know, in reality restrict um, some of the builds for renewables. So in terms of uh, this scenario-based approach uh, that we're taking, so um, kind of some of the uh, assumptions we're making. So we're focusing on resources within Maine and on builds through 2030, so a near-term analysis. Um, and we are uh, going to compare the scenarios to a reference case, which will be, um, you know, informed by the existing interconnection queue and, um, you know, existing uh, costs and performance of uh, resources uh, without, you know, many uh, additional constraints or policy factors. Um, and so that will basically model, you know, what a, what a, the economic approach to uh, meeting the state's RPS goals, you know, without layering on um, a bunch of conditions. And then we're going to model 
four scenarios that emphasize you know, different types of approaches to meeting the state's RPS target um, that have different implications for you know, potential policy or regulatory mechanisms. So the kind of four broad focus areas that we're focusing on, and this is another area, you know, we ask for feedback on the feedback form. Um, so we have an offshore wind uh, scenario that focuses on, you know, floating offshore wind build and uh, what happens if offshore wind is uh, supported and, and, you know, sees uh, potential cost declines and, and what the impacts of that are on uh, generation, cost, equity, et cetera. Uh, we have a uh, distributed energy resources or DER scenario uh, that looks at supporting um, uh, or incentivizing or emphasizing builds on the distribution system. So, you know, whether that's in front of the meter or behind the meter or community level projects, but, um, you know, how would that affect uh, the various outcomes we've mentioned above, cost, infrastructure, et cetera. A load flexibility scenario. So this is really focused on the role of storage and demand response and how you know those could be used to um, you know reduce the need for uh, incre incremental renewable build or sort of increase the value of the existing renewables um, and the implications on cost infrastructure uh, and equity. And then a balanced scenario. So this scenario kind of more explicitly relies on a diverse portfolio and, and looks at the benefits and costs of that resource diversity on the system. So on the next few slides, I'm going to talk through um, the actual modeling tool that we'll use, um, and then I'll hand it over to Brindy. So um, this is a schematic of E3's Excel-based uh, uh, RPS planning tool. Um, you know, I won't go through every square on this page, but I want to basically orient you that, you know, we have two types of inputs. On the top left, we have the demand side of the equation. So, you know, this reflects the load forecast, the RPS target, and the existing and planned renewables on the system. We use this to calculate a renewable net short uh, of the system. So, how many gigawatt hours of renewables are needed? On the bottom left, we have uh, the supply side of the equation. So this is taking into account, you know, several variables that characterize uh, the renewable potential, you know, the uh, potentially available renewables uh, enable, and enable you to construct a supply curve uh, subject to the constraints imposed on that specific scenario. So uh, this will be basically in, put into the model to uh, allow the model to then select a set of resources, you know, based on those scenario constraints. Um, and then uh, from that, we'll have, you know, several key outputs, including costs, ratepayer impacts, build by, you know, geography, I would say at, at a somewhat coarse level, um, and then land and emissions. So, we just want to say kind of real briefly a bit about, um, you know, the types of uh, how we think about the availability of renewables. So um, the idea here is that the process of developing the renewable supply curve is going to start broad, uses the NREL data set for the potential for renewable resources based on uh, geographic features and, um, you know, layers on, I would say, minimal kind of land use and protected area screens. But we know that that number is going to be much higher than the amount of renewables that's actually viable and that you could reasonably build over the course of the next decade. So, you know, some subset of that is going to make up the viable potential. Uh, and then the RPS tool will select a portfolio from uh, what is the set of viable resources, you know, on the basis of economics subject to the constraints. Uh, Within that scenario, uh, I will note, you know, um, that, you know, Maine does have tiers within the RPS. And so, you know, the model will have specific constraints within it to make sure that, you know, uh, the state is meeting the different parts of the RPS appropriately. So, uh, kind of a brief note on, on a very important topic, which is that, you know, we recognize that, you know, joint, joint transmission and generation planning is a complicated uh, task and, uh, you know, we are not doing a detailed power flow analysis for this study and, you know, recognize that detailed site specific planning will be necessary, you know, to accompany actual development. 
Instead, what we do here is we take a zonal approach, applying resources to specific zones. Then uh, within a zone, we can, you know, build some resources without incremental transmission costs. But then, of course, at certain thresholds, um, will require, you know, new transmission investments to enable sort of transfer capacity within and across zones. Um, and I'll note that, you know, we're engaged in conversations with the GEO and stakeholders to nail down uh, some of the uh, specific transportation needs and, and costing within the region. But again, you know, this is an area where we actively, you know, appreciate your perspectives or feedback on, you know, areas where new transmission infrastructure um, you know, is required to really facilitate development. So uh, here is just a slide of uh, the range of data resources that we'll be using for this study. So uh, our approach is to kind of couple kind of credible, publicly available, peer-reviewed sources of renewable potential, technology costs, and performance, and then um, pair that with on the ground main specific resources based on you know conversations with kind of informed stakeholders and um, uh, utilize a bunch of the valuable research being performed within Maine you know through the climate council and through other efforts um, and here you know we've kind of laid out some some of what those key sources are um, but welcome you know your input on specific studies that we should be um, uh, incorporating. So I recognize that's a lot of information at a high level. So um, here I'm going to pass to Brindis to talk a little bit about the equity considerations. And then we're going to open it up for um, your questions and talk about how you can provide written feedback uh, so we can um, you know, both clarify things about what we're doing and then um, you know, provide an opportunity for you to provide uh, uh, more formal feedback. Thank you, Liz. Thanks. I appreciate it. So I'm going to um, do a really brief presentation of some, some equity considerations in Maine. Um, so as da Dan spoke about in the beginning and Liz spoke about uh, earlier, one aspect of this renewable energy assessment is to assess the equity considerations of the various pathways to meet um, Maine's RPS goals, and that's where me and my colleagues at AEC come on board. And we're going to take the results that E3 generates in terms of these various pathways, and we're going to assess the equity considerations of these various pathways. And in order to do that, we need to start by establishing sort of an equity baseline, uh, the current equity context in Maine, which is what I'm going to present for you all here today. But before I jump right in, I'm, I just want to point out that Maine has several organizations um, that have already been discussed, Maine Climate Council, for example, that have existing policies and programs that are working towards greater equity in the energy sector in Maine specifically. And so just to say that, you know, this isn't the first time um, that we're thinking about this or discussing it and this, and there are lots of um, programs and, and policies in place in the state that uh, are targeting vulnerable populations, low income, um, and all of these things are ongoing and important to be aware of. We can go to the next slide, please. So who are, who are Mainers? Who lives in Maine? Uh, let's start there. Uh, in terms of knowing who is vulnerable, you first need to know who everyone is, right? So Maine has a really healthy middle class. Um, it's larger than the national average. Um, the flip side of that is that Maine's um, portion of very wealthy or very poor households is pretty much standard, which is good. Um, you want a situation where you're not vastly overrepresented in terms of your very high income or your very low income households. The fact that what is overrepresented in Maine is the middle class is a good sign. Um, that said, Maine is also a very white state. Uh, less than 10% of the state uh, is made up of people of color and 5% of those are mixed race. So only 5% of the state's population is black, Latinx, Asian, or indigenous. We can go to the next slide. Um, there are some other sort of ways that Maine is unique relative to a national average. 
Um, and those are that Maine has a over representation of people with disabilities. Maine has a very low uh, share of immigrants and um, somewhat associated with that of a relatively low share uh, of limited English speakers has a larger than average share of older people and a smaller than average share of younger people. Um, of course, these things differ within the state itself, but this is just relative to the national average and sort of setting the stage for who Mainers are and who we're talking about. We can go to the next slide, please. So what uh, we did at AEC in order to establish sort of an equity baseline uh, from which to work from uh, when we're assessing the various impacts of renewable energy development pathways was we developed a main social vulnerability index. So what we did here was we took US Census um, American Community Survey data for six variables and we weighted those variables equally um, for the entire state. We did it by um, county, except for Cumberland County where Portland is located. We did that one by census tract, which you can see in that little um, pull out box in the bottom right of the slide. Um, and so we took these six variables, um, children, limited English, low to no income, older adults, people of color and people with disabilities, weighted those things equally. And what you see on the right hand side is the is the index where darker means more vulnerable and lighter means less vulnerable. So what you're seeing is that the most socially vulnerable populations in the state are concentrated in the north and northeastern parts and are characterized most prominently by low to no income, but also by uh, uh, limited English and people of color who are tend to be concentrated in the north and northeastern part of the state as well. Within Cumberland County, you also see when we look at sort of a sub county level, we also see large uh, vulnerability disparities within the county itself and more specifically within Portland itself. So just to say that these sort of broad um, vulnerability trends uh, across counties, it's often not, not so clear cut as everyone in the county is vulnerable. You can have these sort of equity hotspots, let's say. Um, and I just want to point out that this index is unique to Maine. So um, this index is generated within the geographic boundaries of Maine. So what you're seeing is when a community is being identified as vulnerable per this index, it means relative to the rest of the state, not relative to the rest of the country, for example. Okay, we can hop to the next slide, please. And probably most of you on this call are well aware of this fact, but it's a very important tidbit when we're talking about renewable energy development pathways in Maine, which is the fact that Maine as a state is really dependent on fuel oil for heating. Um, and that's particularly relevant uh, in this context because we are considering the greater New England region where that is not true. So uh, fuel oil accounts for about 34% of, of heating households in all of New England, but a, more like 60% in Maine, so it's nearly double. Um, you can also see that wood and, and presumably that category has other kinds of woody biomass um, is also overrepresented in Maine. And what makes this unique is that the rest of the New England region is much more dependent on gas for heating. And we can skip to the next slide. So this is this is my final slide, and this is kind of where we're um, giving you a flavor of where we're heading with the equity analysis. When we're establishing an equity baseline and we're trying to consider what are the differing equity impacts of different renewable energy pathways going to be, the thing that first and foremost is in our mind is this issue of household energy burdens. So household energy burdens, all that means is what percentage of your household income do you spend on energy bills? And what we see in Maine is very similar to what we see throughout the rest of New England and throughout the rest of the country. Energy burden is clearly delineate, delineated by income. So if you look at this figure, you can see the actual energy expenditures in green with the dollar signs above and the percent of household income with percentages on those blue bars along the bottom. And along the X axis, you see the income groupings. So um, our lowest income Mainers are spending nearly a quarter of their income on energy, whereas the 
highest income Mainers are spending less than 5%. And uh, like I mentioned, this is not unique to Maine, um, but that said, from an, when we look at renewable energy development from an equity lens through an equity standpoint, what you want to avoid is first and foremost, any exacerbation of this trend. You don't want to make energy any more expensive than it already is as a percentage of household income for your low income and highly vulnerable households. In a perfect world, we would start to address this energy burden uh, issue in terms of renewable energy development and these renewable energy pathways. We would start to level out what Mainers are paying for energy relative to their income. Um, but at a minimum, we would hope not to, to make this situation any worse. So thank you, Liz. I will pass back to you, I believe. And I hope, I believe we're opening it up for questions shortly. Yes, exactly. So um, as I noted at the onset, um, you can either uh, submit a question. I believe we have several uh, lined up right now um, in the via the chat function on the upper right hand side of your screen, or else raise your hand. Um, my colleague Samrat should be off mute. He's been organizing the the questions, and uh, I think we'll start off with you know reading some out and providing some responses, and um, then we can move to folks with their hands raised. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Yeah, we've been receiving a couple of questions on the chat uh, uh, feature. Uh, so I'll just read out one of the questions. When you look at existing and planned uh, renewables, are you including the resources currently in the queue for interconnection through either the NEB or tariff-based programs? For context, CMP claims that it has 861 megawatts of nameplate projects in their pipeline, in their NEB pipeline. Would you assume that a certain proportion of these projects would uh, sell their uh, RECs into the market. Uh, yes, we are going to look at the uh, queues and we're going to consider uh, the different uh, uh, programs, the NEB and the tariff-based programs, and we're currently developing screens uh, to decide how much, uh, what the, the portion of those projects that should be incorporated into our uh, baseline. Um, a second question is, uh, this is analysis for main class one and class uh, one RPS. Um, I, I take it the RPS analysis will be for all of New England as renewable generation that is in or deliverable to New England is eligible for main class one RPS. Is this correct? Uh, that, that is correct. Uh, we are going to look at all the generators that are eligible for main uh, class one or one uh, A Rex. Uh, so, uh, while the focus of this study is on Maine, we do take into consideration, we are planning on taking into consideration uh, generators that are, that are situated outside of Maine, but do qualify for uh, Maine RECs. Um, okay. Let me see. I think there is another question. If there is a focus on offshore wind, will there be a focus on environmental justice issues as it relates to uh, fishermen? Um, Brindis or Dan, would one of you take this question? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that. I think that uh, it's, a, it's an important question. I think it's uh, one, one thing I didn't mention up front is, you know, the state does have a, a, an offshore wind initiative and have just received funding for, from the, the federal government, uh, $2.16 million to put together a 10-year uh, offshore wind roadmap, which in, includes kind of a, a comprehensive uh, look at uh, the future of the offshore wind industry in Maine. And so while maybe, uh, you know, a potential portion of discussion here, I think it's more likely the uh, those kind of in-depth in issues are more likely to be, uh, or talked about in depth in that uh, other process. Thanks, Dan. Um, okay, I think we have a raised hand. I'm gonna unmute them. Okay, uh, Steve Klemmer, you're unmuted. Hi, thanks. Uh, that was really helpful. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. One is, is this uh, projections going to be limited to 2030 or, or are you going to go all the way out to 2050? 
Um, and then uh, I'll pause on that for a second and ask my second question that's different than that. Yeah, thanks, Steve. The focus of this study is on 2030 and actions that can be taken up to 2030. Uh, but we are planning on conducting uh, analysis that looks beyond 2030 as well uh, to see uh, whether to make sure that the recommendations that come out of the study are on track, uh, you know, to, to make sure that the state uh, is on track to meet the 2050 goals as well. But the focus, though, is still going to be 2030. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think um, obviously going beyond 2030 is going to be really important for offshore wind. Um, so I was just mostly curious about that. Um, the second question, I guess, is related for Brenda, which is um, I'm trying to get my head around exactly what you're planning on doing for the equity part of the analysis. And I'm, I'm just wondering if part of it's going to consider, is it is it only going to be based on what the cost of meeting the RPS is and what impact that could have on um, disadvantaged communities? Or are, are you also going to be looking at the location of some of the renewables that could be cited in um, disadvantaged communities and and how how that might how those constituencies might benefit or might be able to deploy those technologies which probably comes down to policies and programs that would be needed to make that happen yeah that's a that's a great question um we are in terms of the model outputs from E3 that we're going to primarily be using for the equity assessment, that will be the rate impacts side of things. And um, we're going to have those uh, by customer class, and we're going to make some assumptions in order to break down the residential uh, into, you know, subclasses of some kind, hopefully, you know, the percentage of residential that's been identified as low income. Um, via Maine's other initiatives and, and use those kinds of things in order to start to talk through what kinds of energy cost impacts you might expect and, you know, uh, what that would mean for, for different uh, Maine households. That'll be the sort of specific utilization of the modeling outputs. We're also going to have sort of higher level conversations based on, you know, lessons learned from the literature and from these efforts uh, in other states and within Maine and outside of Maine in other states to have sort of a, a larger discussion about these um, bigger questions around sort of like renewable siting, for example, you mentioned. Um, we're not going to do like a a disaggregated job impact analysis of any kind, but we will be having a conversation about, um, you know, clean energy jobs and who, ha you know, lessons learned from elsewhere in terms of, of trying to make those benefits as equitable as possible across Maine's population. Um, I hope that answers your question. I've seen a couple of others come up about equity too, so um, I assume I will be asked again if I need to be more specific. Yeah, thanks, Brindis, for the question. I'm going to go to other questions now. Uh, we have another question that, that is, uh, how will your energy forecast consider a future with greater beneficial electrification and higher penetrations of renewables? Maine is a winter peaking energy system, and it would seem like renewable energy resources that can engage at peak times should be particularly prioritized for cost avoidance. That is absolutely correct. Uh, we do plan on uh, looking at resources and their uh, capacity value. Uh, and the value uh, they have at reducing load during peak times. So we, we are definitely going to look at the capacity contributions of different resources, whether that is solar or wind or uh, offshore wind, and how they how their uh, uh, output coincides with uh, the main uh, system peak. So so yeah, we, we're already considering that. Thanks for the question. Um, I think another question is. Without load flow analysis, how will the benefit of new transmission infrastructure be included in the overall analysis? Uh, so, as Les pointed out during the presentation, we are not trying to do a, a load flow analysis or a big production cost simulation model. This study is primarily focused on teasing out the uh, the policy uh, options available. Uh, so, uh, but we do understand that uh, you know transmission plays a big role. So, we're planning on. At a, at a very high level, we're looking at a different uh, transmission zones, and we're definitely using the uh, recent LE uh, 1401 uh, stakeholder study on transmission uh, to inform the the uh, you know 
the, the, the major constraints, the major interfaces that are constrained and look at the existing headroom on the system. And we have discussions going on with stakeholders right now to see how much uh, headroom there is on, ex on the existing system and to figure out what the cost of upgrading and at what point those upgrades need to happen. Thanks for that question. Um, I think, let me go to the next question. It says, uh, um, the presentation and the study appears to be focused entirely on electricity, but uh, LD 1494 enacted a significant thermal component. Does the scope of the study include focus on thermal or just electricity? Um, yeah, I can, Dan? I, I can take, yeah, I can take that. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I should have um, clarified that up front. You know, the uh, 1494 does include the, you know, obviously the T-REC uh, initiative, but the study language itself is really focused on electricity sales and the 80% the number. And so I think uh, the modeling analysis that are, is being done will be focused on the electricity sector. I mean, I think, um, you know, overall, obviously the, the thermal component is a, is a piece of the RPS and I don't think that will be ignored, but the main focus of, of the report and the analysis will be the, will be the electricity sector. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, Brindis, I think there's another question for you. Can you be more specific in providing what issues are to be addressed as part of the social justice issues? Sorry, having trouble unmuting myself. Um, I think I might have already answered that uh, with the first question. So I'll just, I'll give a nutshell version um, from the E3 modeling, we're primarily going to look at the rate impacts, um, but in a more uh, qualitative way, we're going to discuss the broader and equity implications of a renewable energy transition. So um, we will consider things like jobs and housing costs and energy costs and, um, you know, all of all of these various aspects, but in terms of the actual quantitative assessment that is going to be driven primarily by these energy rate impacts of the various development pathways. Thanks, Brindis. Um, looking at a couple more questions here. What is the data source E3 plans to use for floating offshore wind pricing? Uh, I think the most recent uh, data source we have is the NREL uh, Aqua Winter Study. Uh, so that is what uh, I think we're going to use because that uses actual project cost information from the uh, Aqua Winter Study uh, and uh, has been vetted by stakeholders. Um, I think another question is, can you speak to the trade-off between citing renewables in Maine and providing RECs for the RPS? I ask because it is common for a renewable project to be cited in Maine with its RECs being sold uh, elsewhere in the uh, New England market. Uh, that, that is a good question. Um, um, since we're trying to focus uh, you know, on Maine uh, and the uh, resources available to meet Maine's load here, uh, uh, I, uh, the impact uh, citing a resource within Maine, uh, but not really, you know, but, but selling the rec elsewhere would primarily be through, through the uh, headroom on transmission. So we would uh, look at any such projects that are available. And, you know, if you have information on how we should consider this, we welcome your feedback. Uh, uh, but primarily, I think what we're uh, thinking of doing is if your existing headroom is going down within Maine because uh, the energy is being sold elsewhere, we would take that into consideration and assume that only the reduced uh, headroom is uh, available for Maine. But as I said, as Liz mentioned during the conversation, uh, this is an active area of discussion. This is very closely tied to transmission. So uh, yeah, I think we will uh, revisit that. Um, another question is, I think this could be for uh, Geo. Uh, why have a focus area specifically on offshore wind? It would seem like a clear focus on terrestrial wind would fit better within the 10 year execution time frame, given all the uncertainties and protracted timelines with offshore wind. It's great to focus on offshore wind, but I would imagine that there would be lots of leakage into the longer time frame. Um, yeah, either the Geo or E3 could take that. 
Um, you know, I think I would, I think that's a, a really good question. And I, uh, I've seen a few questions that are kind of similar in vain about how are you going to treat that or what does that look like? I, mean, I think important to step back and say that is part of the point of this, of this uh, webinar and, and uh, stakeholder engagement process is to get feedback. And I think we're very interested in hearing that. I, you know, uh, the fur to E3 the assumption I would make is that the, you know, the terrestrial wind will almost certainly be a part of the, that initial kind of balanced portfolio or an, and part of the baseline, but that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a, um, a, a focus on that. It's something that, that we could think about, but I'd, I'd ask E3 to, to weigh in. Yeah, and this is Lakshmi, and that's exactly right. Given sort of the interconnection cues and sort of the uh, cost information we have right now on technologies today, we would expect a fair amount of sort of onshore wind to, to be in that baseline case. Um, and so really what we're trying to do through the scenario analysis is see, um, you know, what, what policy and regulatory mechanisms might sort of uh, create different um, portfolios for us to assess and, and sort of look at the cost and equity considerations associated with those. But we'll definitely have onshore and terrestrial wind in our, our cases that we'll uh, be able to compare. Okay, thanks, Lakshmi. Uh, so I'm gonna unmute uh, Ian Burns. Ian? Uh, thanks, thanks, guys. Uh, this is a follow up on that. Uh, the in state versus out of state renewable energy credits. Could you show that by looking at the net energy billing program right now that I don't believe has the requirement that the sponsors sell their recs, retire their recs, or sell them to another, the highest market? If you made an assumption that any project over a megawatt or some threshold sold their recs into the main market versus sold them into the Massachusetts market, um, and potentially even looking at a policy scenario in which they were required to retire their recs toward the goals, you might be would would your analysis allow you to sort of show some of those the the the, the impact of those three different scenarios? Um, I think we can get to that, uh, um, we can get to that, Ian, because, you know, we're not looking at specific programs and what sort of rec payments they can get. What we're, what we will be doing though, is, you know, assuming that there is a market for recs and there is a, there is a price for those recs. Um, and, you know, it, it is going to be a least cost model. So we are going to assume that. To meet uh, the state's goals, the 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 least uh, cost recs from each of your different classes will be used to uh, uh, will be used to meet the the state's goals. Now, um, I, I that, that that is slightly different from the question of you know what uh, an individual uh, program uh, does. You know wh whether the NEB uh, wh whether an NEB project decides to sell their rec to you know outside of Maine. Uh, because we're looking at this from the state's perspective, not from an individual participant's perspective and looking at what is, you know, most economic from the state. Okay. Uh, you still might be, I mean, considering all of those net energy billing projects have sort of different incentives than a market based transmission linked system would have. If you assume them as the lowest cost resource, given. The support that they're getting through the net energy billing and tariff rate, that might be a way of showing that, that that certainly would be the lowest cost if you're looking at it from that. And the other one would be certainly if you could have them retired toward it. Um, it's just a, it, it's a it's a big program with a lot of projects in it right now that. So, anyhow, I think that, that being. You know, it's part of the reason I'm tuning in is to try to see how we treat that um, because it's going to have an impact on our avoided costs as well. Yeah, thanks, Ian. I, I think I get I get what you're saying here. And, and you know, sort of if there are a large amount of recs that could be retired from that program, that will sort of change the overall portfolio that we end up um, sort of developing for, uh, say, like the DER scenario or another one of the scenarios. And so that's definitely something that we can take into consideration as we're um, sort of finalizing our scenario design. Great, yep. thank you. 
Thanks, Lakshmi. Um, we have a couple more questions on transmission. One of them is, will the study look for different mechanisms to pay for transmission upgrades? Um, and then uh, the, uh, the second question is, will ISO New England's second main resource integration study be used as a data input? Uh, so, yes, we are using uh, ISO New England's both first and second uh, resource integration studies as our uh, data inputs, and we are using them to also inform uh, the different uh, transmission zones within the model. And to the question of whether the study will look at different mechanisms to pay for transmission upgrades, I think that is still uh, to be decided because first we'll be focusing on the physical need of the system and should the model results point to a, a significant transmission need, I think then the second question will be, you know, what are the options uh, to pay for those transmission upgrades. And certainly at that point, we'll be looking at different mechanisms to pay for uh, the upgrades and what sort of support is needed there. Um, thanks for the question. Um, okay, I think there's another question. Uh, I think, Brindis, this is for you. Would it make sense to calculate the social uh, vulnerability index by census tract for uh, Andres Coggin as well as LA? Uh, this is it's certainly very different for the rest of the country. Um, it, oh, okay. I see. Uh, yeah, we're, um, I would plan to do, um, a tract level analysis for certainly the, I had planned to do the ones that fell into our highest vulnerability index, but I see that Andrew Scoggin is kind of in the middle there. But yes, any suggestions for where we should be looking more specifically because you have, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not from Maine. I don't live in Maine. So this kind of feedback in terms of where we should be zooming in uh, is very welcome. And yeah, I'm happy to take a look at whatever counties you guys think are going to be meaningful by tract. Okay. Um... I think another question is, are you assuming LMI households uh, will be installing heat pumps, uh, which are part of the load forecast and solar as part of a single family or multifamily housing that could help lower energy fuel expenditures and offset any rate impacts from the RPS? Grindis, is that a question for you? Uh, I, I, that's kind of a baseline question, right? Um, yeah. I think I'll hand it off to E3. Yeah, I think yeah, this sort so, of goes back to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Liz. Oh, it, it goes back to the synapse data inputs, I think, that we use for the load forecast. So there is some assumptions in there around the, um, around things like heat pump adoption and uh, uh, I think DERs as well. And so basically to the extent that um, uh, heat pump adoption is incorporated in the specific load forecast, um, it will be, uh, input into this study. Um, I will say that, you know, uh, we are still finalizing which of the uh, recently released synapse load forecasts we use. And so, um, you know, welcome your feedback on the feedback form uh, regarding, you know, which one is the most appropriate, but that will certainly drive the total amount of uh, RPS build. And I'll just follow up that from an equity perspective, obviously, you know, we're going to be in close coordination with E3 as they developed the baseline and the various scenarios. And so I'll be aware of, you know, these various equity considerations that are baked in before I even start the analysis of, of the pathways. So we'll definitely be highlighting things like that that have an equity component um, in our portion of the work. Thanks, Brindis. Uh, I think we have another raised hand. Let's unmute them. Steve. Yeah, thanks. This is Steve again. And that was my question about the <laughs> LMI households. Just to follow up to that. My, my point is really that if you're only looking at the rate impact uh, from the RPS on low income households, that's a little misleading because, you know, if, because if those households are also installing heat pumps or doing solar, which obviously is gonna have a big impact in lowering their energy expenditures because most of those expenditures are fuel expenditures. I'm just um, wondering, you know, from an energy burden standpoint, um, if you're only including the, 
the rate impact, it's not really telling the whole story. But at the same time, for those households to install heat pumps and solar also requires, you know, some programs and policies that would have to make that happen and financing. Yeah, it's it's always going to be a delicate balance, right, between acknowledging what the state is already doing and our assumption that those things come to pass, right? Like, so presumably some of this main, mains current initiatives for LMI households will be to a certain extent baked into the baseline. But in terms of our rate impact analysis, I'm really just focusing on differential impacts. So whatever is baked into the model is baked in, and I hope that you know we do a good enough job explaining what that means for vulnerable households and why you know what that includes and and sort of the benefits of existing action. Um, but in terms of our energy cost analysis, I'm really just going to focus in on what are the differential impacts across these various renewable uh, development pathways. Thanks, Brindis. Um, okay, I think the next question is, I believe, uh, actually, yeah. What, what assumptions are you making on federal tax credits for uh, renewables? Um, yeah, uh, the existing credits uh, are all embedded into our uh, cost assumptions. We have ITC for offshore wind uh, going out to 2023 and uh, PVC for onshore wind to uh, 2023 as well. Um, I think, Another question is, I, I believe the focus indicated it would be a main based renewables, but uh, does this mean the analysis will explicitly exclude consideration of additional Canadian hydropower uh, or certified eligible or certified as RPS eligible? Uh, there's a notable difference. Um, I don't think the study is going to explicitly uh, exclude uh, any additional Canadian hydropower if uh, there is publicly available information uh, that that uh, power would be delivered in the next, you know, um, uh, within the 2030 timeframe. But I, I just wanted to remind everyone that this is a 2030 focused uh, timeframe. So we certainly have, uh, we certainly, you know, have information on the NECC and are actively thinking about how to put that into the uh, model itself. And if anyone has additional information that they think is pertinent to this particular question, we welcome the feedback. Please send that over to us. Um, I think another question is the LD1711 analysis is now significantly dated and does not reflect the dramatic uh, renewable development that has occurred since, including nearly two gigawatts of DG in the, in the current interconnection queues of CMP and Versant. Will there be any outreach to the utilities to evaluate these more uh, recent impacts? Uh, if we can get access to the interconnection queues, we, we already have access to the CMP queue uh, as well as the ISO New England queue. We are using the queues to uh, uh, inform our uh, uh, supply curves. Uh, and we also have the uh, recent uh, procurement uh, that, that has uh, that, that has been undertaken uh, as part of our baseline. Um, and we'll be looking at uh, other queues, for example, the Versan queue as well. Thank you. I believe, oh, uh, there's one more question. I just wanna, to, you know, to that question and, and others, I mean, you know, I think, again, this is the, the start of this process. The more information that uh, the consultants and the GEO have from you all that are here, the better informed the study is going to be. And that is, you know, the start of this. And I think we're, we need to have kind of further conversations, um, you know, more details where, you know, my office is definitely open to doing that to make sure that this, you know, study will, uh, you know, reflect the, the latest and uh, best information and really help us think about, um, policies around the RPS going forward. So a lot of questions about kind of considering this or that, and, um, you know, that, that that's definitely the goal. Yep. Um, okay, I think we have a couple of uh, uh, REC focused questions. How are RECs considered in the scenario is energy only contracts for, like the recent tranche one RFP aren't renewables and no guarantee RECs will be available to Maine at low cost as they have been historically. The second question is, uh, 
Will the study also be reviewing uh, procurement strategies to help Maine achieve its climate goals? Uh, I think these are good questions. Uh, again, uh, as I mentioned, th this study, the, the very first uh, goal of this study is to establish need. Once the need is established, then the focus will shift to identifying procurement strategies on how to meet that need. Uh, and you know, by default, uh, since this is a, a, a least cost uh, or most, we're, we're trying to find the most economic way of meeting uh, your renewable need, we would assume we would be taking both the rec and the energy portion uh, uh, to see uh, you know, uh, whether a bundle product or individual products is the most economic way, way to meet, but uh, we don't have a way to answer that question until we actually establish need first. Uh, we hope to get to this, uh, you know, during the report or during uh, the next webinar. Um, I think those are the questions. All the questions here look green to me. Uh, with that, uh, I think we already answered this question. Um, yeah, I think those are the questions. So it looks like we have a raised hand. Bruce, uh, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead, Bruce. Um, okay, it uh, looks like we've lost audio from Bruce. Um, okay, just shifting through the questions here. Will the impact of cost of capital be considered and uh, analyzed um yes uh, that will be uh, analyzed uh, all the uh, raw costs we're getting from either nrel or the uh, uh main integration studies will be passed through uh, e3's pro forma uh and ultimately we'll be getting an annualized cost which will then be uh, going as inputs into the uh into the uh, rps tool itself thanks for that question Yeah, it looks like those are the questions right now. Um, Liz, uh, back to you. If more questions come up, then I guess we can, uh, uh, I'll, I'll interrupt you. That sounds good. And uh, so we have a list of uh, feedback questions um, that uh, you are able to submit uh, over the course of the next week um, through a written online form. Um, and so, uh, you know, this link will be publicly posted with the, with the slide deck, uh, for you to, um, uh, be able to provide your feedback. Um, so you can submit your feedback, uh, which we also posted on the geo RPS study page. Um, and we're looking for both, um, you know, specific responses to the questions we've raised here, as well as, you know, other general feedback on the study or considerations that you want to make sure. Um, or you would like to see, you know, incorporated into the, into the study. Um, we ask, you know, given the, the kind of tight turnaround on this project, we want to make sure, you know, if you can, uh, submit feedback, uh, over the course of the next week, uh, by next Friday, the 13th. Uh, and, uh, you can also, if you have, to, if you'd like to submit a, uh, document, uh, you can also submit it as an attachment, uh, via email to, uh, Melissa Winnie. Um, so this just gives you a sense of what the form looks like. <laughs> uh, so then, you know, just in terms of the process, um, uh, yep, uh, uh, let me, I'll, I'll go through the process and then I think there might be a few more questions rolling in. So we, I think we'll have a few minutes we can circle back to those. Um, but in terms of the process and schedule, you know, we're asking for feedback on, uh, you know, what we've presented today and the study approach uh, by next Friday, the 13th. Um, we will be continuing uh, to perform this analysis uh, through uh, the end of the year and into January 2021. Um, at the end of uh, December or, you know, in the end of the year, we'll be presenting draft results um, so that we can get your feedback on our draft findings. Um, before the, the final study is released at the end of January. Um, and then we will do a, a final webinar again at the end uh, after everything is public um, in February. 
So, you know, if there are any questions on that or, uh, you know, continued questions on the study itself, we do have, you know, 15 or so minutes left. So, um, Samrat, we can open the queue back up. Yep. Um, thanks, Liz. I'm going to unmute Bruce. Uh, Bruce? Bruce, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Okay, looks like we're still having audio trouble. Um, While but, we're waiting for, for, for Bruce to see if he can um, work out the audio, I do want to, uh, I've gotten a couple of requests for the, the slides to be posted and, you know, the, the, all that information will be up on, on the GEO webpage. There's a renewable energy market assessment webpage, uh, so we'll make sure that those are posted there. Okay. Marty, uh, you're unmuted. Hi, thanks. Uh, Marty Groman from E2 Tech. Uh, I guess the question is uh, largely for Brindis. It, it's an incredibly interesting analysis on, on uh, the low income and energy equity. And you mentioned, you know, accepting or being receptive to feedback about Maine. I mean, are there other kind of tools or anything that we help with? It, it's it seems like one of our biggest challenges and I'm feeling personally motivated to try to take it on. And so it's just kind of an ask for anything we can be doing to help. Oh, thank you. Uh, I love the sentiment. Um, as you might imagine, uh, usually the limitation with what I can do uh, equity analysis wise is data. <laughs> the problem is always data. So, um, I have a bunch of American community survey data. Um, I've been in contact with uh, some folks elsewhere in Maine working on uh, low and, and median income housing um, projects. So presumably I'm going to be getting a little bit of data there. If you know of anything else, uh, feel free to send it my way. If you have suggestions for reports I should be aware of, feel free to send that my way too. Um, if anyone happen, anyone on this call happens to know whether and how I can get my hands on utility disconnection or utility arrear data, that would be like the best thing in the world. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you've, you know, I'm, I'm the, the beautiful thing about equity analysis is because it's new you and because data is often limited, you, you get to kind of make it up as you go based on what you get, what you have, what you have available. So the most you could do to help me is put me in touch with people who know about more data, or if you know more data, or send me suggestions, reports, information, all that jazz. Thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, we have one more question that that is is storage going to be part of the study uh, yes storage will be available for the model uh, uh, to pick resources uh, uh, from and, and then um, we also have specifically a load flexibility focus area as you saw in one of the slides uh, and that uh, uh, that that um, scenario would be focusing on uh, storage as part of the load flexibility uh, argument um, okay I think those are all the questions. Yeah, Liz, I think those are all the questions. Great. Well, um, yeah, as we said, uh, this information will be posted on the um, GEO uh, RPF study page, and there will also be a link um, where you can uh, submit feedback as well as um, the link will be uh, within the deck as well. So. Um, we really appreciate everyone taking the time to, uh, you know, listen and provide feedback on uh, this important effort. Um, you know, Maine has uh, big goals, and uh, I think you know we're excited for this uh, study to help inform uh, how we get there. Um, Dan, is there anything that you all, you all at the the geo want to say as we close up? Uh, no, just appreciate everyone spending the, this. Uh part of the Friday afternoon with us and really encourage folks to uh, submit public comments. Please share with, uh, you know, others who may be interested, uh, really helpful to get as much feedback up front as possible. So appreciate all the thoughtful questions and the time and 
looking forward to, to moving this forward. Yeah, Dan, I think there's one more question. When do we expect the geo page to be updated with the survey and the deck? Melissa? I would say, yeah, probably Monday um, would be safe, safe bet. Uh, I'm not sure we'd be able to get the IT folks to do it in the next hour or two, but um, I think I think by Monday we'd probably get it up and posted. The link, uh, folks should be able. To, I don't know if we can put that link in the chat um, if that's helpful for for folks if they don't have it, but so they can start working on feedback now. Does someone do you want to copy and paste it into the chat for all participants? Uh, we yeah. can also send a follow up email to to everyone who. Who registered to, I'm sure. But. Great. I'm going to send it to everyone now. Okay, so the link to the feedback form is now posted in the chat. Yeah, and we can also follow up uh, with email and uh, get it posted on the, the website. Great. Thanks everyone for taking the time uh, out of your afternoon. Um, we really appreciated the, the chance to have this conversation. Thanks Thank you everyone. Have a great weekend. Thanks everyone.